Good morning. So happy you're here for the Diversity and Belonging Conference. We're already on day three, and I feel like so, so many rich offerings have already occurred, and yet we look at the schedule and so many are yet to happen, including this fabulous panel. So I will make the announcements and then um, turn it over. The announcements are basically coffee. It will be served today from 9 to 11, and then again this afternoon from 1.30 to 3.30 with, I think, some cookies this afternoon, but not this morning because our session is rather brief. And then another coffee announcement is that tomorrow in the Moore building, we are not allowed to have open coffee service. So um, stock up on your own. We will have bottled water, apples, and some other refreshments there for you, but no caffeinated beverages <laughs> if you need that. And um, with those announcements, we will turn it over to Dr. Louise Toppin, who is professor of voice here and also has degrees in piano and organ and is an editor of Black Music Collections with the Demos, of, which she founded a real mover shaker. We're so pleased she's on our committee and sharing this panel. Thank you, Louise. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome to this session we have entitled Decolonizing the Standard, can canon, Standard Keyboard Canon. What is the canon and how did we get here? To quote a blog from Linda Shaver Gleason in response to the 2016 League of American Orchestras Conference discussing the future of classical music and the canon. So the fact that it was being discussed in 2016 and, be and, and before is interesting. So quote, first of all, what is the canon? Generally, when musicians mention the canon, they mean a core set of pieces that are especially famous and most people recognize as classical music. It's the overplayed war horses that audiences will pay to listen to. More cynically, it's the pieces people will mention when they want to prove or pretend they know something about classical music. A truncated history extracted from her, her blog. In general, prior to the 19th century, most live performances of music were in service of aristocrats and catered to their personal tastes. After the French Revolution, however, European society changed. The aristocrats lost influence and the public gained greater power. Whether a piece was good or not was no longer determined by a particular individual but by mutually agreed upon standards that emerged in the 19th century. This century is when there started to be a clear division between high and low music. It became crucial to people, people's social standing to demonstrate that they had good taste by liking the right kind of music, and in order to do so, they had to educate themselves about it. So the 1800s saw a boom in music criticism, journalism, history books, textbooks, and lectures all reinforcing the idea that certain pieces were better and more important than others. This period also coincides with a few other trends that determined what those pieces would be. Prior to the 19th century, the music that was performed in public was mostly new. Isn't that interesting when we think about new music being slipped into there, but that was all there was. Old music was studied and practiced, but if people were going to attend a concert, they expected to hear something they hadn't heard before. That there had been the trend, for, that that had been the trend for centuries. In the 15th century, music theorist Johannes Tinctora said that the only music worth listening to was that which had been written in the last 40 years. So that means for us, what, the 1980s? So everything before the 1980s, sorry. <laughs> music was constantly advancing and people wanted to see what was next. But around 1800, history became fashionable. People became interested in the music of the past and they wanted to hear it. Beethoven was among the first composers whose music never left the concert hall. Since this trend emerged just as the ideas of high and low music coalesced, many old com compositions got categorized as high art and people could show off their taste and education by liking historical works. 
Another trend in the 19th century was a rise in nationalism, particularly in German-speaking lands. Germany was trying to unify politically, and one way to do that was to promote a common German culture. This meant that Austro-German composers were presented as attaining the highest achievements in art. Now, if the idea of a rise in German nationalism makes you squirm, there's a good reason. Yes, this is the same cultural movement that led to world wars in the 20th century. That also plays a factor in why the classical music canon is the way it is. Many Austro-German intellectuals fled Europe because of the wars, some of them finding jobs in American universities. There they passed on the culture in which they'd been raised, the one that promoted German composers as the epitome of high art music. We inherited this tradition, and that's why so many canonic composers are dead German men. I just think it's, it's good sometimes to take a step back and think about how did we get here. Not all the works in the canon are German or written before 1850, of course. Other pieces have found their way in over time. But again, in order to do so, they've had to overcome a lot of cultural inertia. We still consider classical music an indicator of status. And there are certain works we're expected to know if we can call ourselves classical music fans or culturally literate. Therefore, if we have this well-established canon, can it be changed? One comment that garnered a great deal of attention from that conference, to paraphrase the comment was, the canon is not laws of physics. You can definitely change the canon. That's from Simon Breckenborough. Our guests for today's panel have been thinking about offering solutions and actively challenging our conception of the standard canon. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists, Connor Chi, who is a, native, a Navajo pianist and composer whose solo piano music is inspired by traditional Navajo chants and songs. Lear Claiborne, who champions piano music by black composers in her performances, researching, and teaching, which is at the University of the District of Columbia and Ana Maria Otamendi, who was a Venice, who is, a, not was, sorry, past tense, <laughs> she's not there, who is a Venezuelan pianist heard in recital last night. She is the director of the Collaborative Piano Institute at Louisiana State University. I hope you will read their full bios in your program booklet because there are other gems that talk about their commitment to this music. Our conversation will consist of questions for each of the panelists and then a Q&A period at the end of our discussion with you. So I'd like to start with our first question. You have chosen to advocate for repertoire that is outside of the standard keyboard canon. Can you speak about your journey with this repertoire? What inspired you to champion Navajo, Latin American, or African diaspora repertoire? Um, and Leah, would you like to start and go down this way? Yes. Well, thank you for so much for um, inviting me to this conference and to be part of this fantastic um, panel. Um, I was really thinking about this first question, and it's hard to think about where did it all start, you know, when you get so deep into it. But I remember vividly, I was taking a class here at University of Michigan. Um, it was a pedagogy class uh, with Dr. John Ellis, and we were sitting in the class, and we were talking about this pedagogue, Leszczykowski, and he has this famous quote where he felt that his French students would play French music better than anyone else, or his German students would play German music better than anyone else. Um, and I really started thinking about that, although I, I don't agree with that notion, but I started thinking, well, what about African American music, right? Why, why aren't we talking about the pedagogical approaches in that manner, right? And then I went through this downward spiral, you know, <laughs> as many people do when they're doing their DMA. Um, and I started thinking, okay, here I am, 25 years, you know, studying piano music, and not once have I performed a piece at that point by a black composer. Um, not once had I had a teacher encourage me, you know, up until that point to, to do that. So I really started to fully feel the weight of understanding that there's such a void. There's such a void that needs to be addressed. Um, so my approach with this came from the pedagogical lens of it. 
And I say this because I am a teacher um, and I think there's just so much power for educators, right? If we think of it from the educator's point of view, right? What if we started this advocacy, if you want to call it advocacy, I just think it's performing and playing great music. What if we started it at the earliest levels, right? That way, there is an expectation that this is music that I'm supposed to be learning, right? I want you all to think about, maybe it's just me, I don't know. Do you all remember your first piano piece or vocal piece or something that you performed, right? My first piece was Love Somebody, it's in a method book. <laughs> and I remember like the you know pictures of the bears and the hearts and everything. And I love that piece. And literally two years after I way passed that piece, when someone said, Leah, Leah, can you play me something? I wanted to play Love Somebody because I love that feeling of my first recital piece. You know, it, it gives all the you know the warm feelings. I, I had a successful moment. Um, but then I thought, what what if that piece was by a black composer? You know, what if teachers were to give Florence Price teaching pieces where we're just trying to figure out quarter notes and half notes, right? What if a teacher were to give um, Ignatius Sancho when we're trying to do uh, Bach minuets, right? There's so much music out there at the very beginning levels. And I feel really that's the place to start because if we start looking at the advanced repertoire when someone's already a professional, think of all these years that they've already missed out on. And then you're trying to, what I say, unteach this notion mm -hmm. that we have this canon, right? But if we take our steps early on and think about what can I do now for this student so that their first exposure of this music is at the beginning level. I'm, I'm sure we all are. <laughs> we all here are doing that work. I have to tell you, it makes all the difference. Because now I have students saying, can I learn something else by Nathaniel Dutt? What else is there by Samuel Porridge Taylor, right? So for me, I really put so much emphasis and power based on the teacher, the educators, because we are the ones who are going to have that ability to shift this culture. Um, in Latin America, it's a little different, at least, I mean, I was born and raised in Venezuela. I lived there for the first 21 years of my life. And um, at least in terms of piano, most students do play Venezuelan music and Latin American music. The issue, though, is like some, it's always the same stuff, you know, because it's the things that people know. So most students end up playing the same pieces, like the same five, 10 pieces, you know, by a Venezuelan composer. And uh, of course, that's, I think it's, it's something, but it's definitely not enough. Uh, and that was my experience. So then I came here, and of course, I forgot all about that as soon as I was studying here, I did my master's, I did a certificate. And then I, I came here to the University of Michigan, and um, I was trying to figure out what to play for my dissertation recitals. And I don't, I wish I remember, I mean, I, I remember Professor Katz has a class on Spanish art song, uh, Spanish and Italian art song, both from Spain and from Latin America. And um, it occurred to me, it's like, well, I should do something with music from South America, right? It just only go, it seems logical. So I curated one of my lecture recitals on South American art song. And I vividly remember, once you start on that rabbit hole, it's like, oh my God, there is so much repertoire. How come I didn't know about all this incredible repertoire, right? So I was first started with, with art song, and it was so beautiful, and every time I played it, people would be like, wow, those songs are awesome. They have so much contrast. Like, I feel like I want to dance when you're like playing those songs. I was like, wow, okay, people obviously like it. And I think it offers a fantastic contrast if you're playing other things, you know, playing Debussy, and then you play some of this repertoire. Um, and I also think in the area of art song, it's a wonderful pedagogical resource because Spanish is a wonderful language to sing in. Um, I think people should sing in Spanish before they sing in Italian because you have five vowels instead of seven, and you can use the exact same vowels later on in Italian, you know? And it's very conducive to great singing because of the nature of the language. 
Um, so um, I'm not coaching singers as much as I used to, but it's something that I, I remember, and I remember talking to my colleagues and say, hey, you should give this to your students. Of course, it's kind of out of my hands, but you know, it is something, and a lot of times people will be very open to it, and students will be very excited about it. Uh, so that's how my journey began. Then I started discovering the chamber repertoire from Latin America after that, and then I had the, the pleasure of reconnecting with my colleagues Simon and Horacio, and then we established a piano trio, and since the three of us are from Venezuela, and we're immigrants here um, for the same reason, we all left at different points, and um, every time we get together to play, it feels like a little bit of home, since we no longer have a home because the country that we knew doesn't exist anymore, and all of our families are spread out throughout the world. Um, so every time we get together, it's like a little piece of home, and uh, their spouses are also Venezuelans, so uh, sometimes we all get together, and it's like, oh, this is what it used to feel like, you know, when, when we were there. Um, and uh, the, the more I look into it, the more I discover, and the more composers that I had never heard of come up. And we'll talk later about challenges and how to overcome those challenges. But um, I, I really, truly, like you say, I truly believe it's such a wonderful repertoire. And I couldn't agree more. I think the earlier you start, it no longer becomes an issue. It's not, it's just normal. And that's the way it should be, you know? It's normal to do all this, like, by black composers and Navajo composers and Latin American composers, and why not, you know? Thank you. Uh, my journey, getting to where I am today as, a, as an indigenous composer, uh, definitely there was a shift because I started out just as a performer and playing the pieces in this standard keyboard canon. And throughout my education, you know, I always wanted something to sort of connect to my roots because my earliest influences in, in music were listening to my grandfather sing traditional Navajo songs and chants. And there was definitely a divide in my mind uh, as I went through education, like the difference between these two uh, forms of music. Um, and it was after I finished my master's degree and I decided I needed to go home and I, it actually started as somewhat of a preservation project uh, for myself because Navajo music is an oral tradition. It's not written down. Uh, and a lot of it's getting lost uh, just due to the rippling effects of cultural genocide and uh, the, the loss of the language. And so I wanted to try and preserve some of these songs that my grandfather knew uh, and that he would sing. And it wasn't something that I could just write down in sheet music. And um, I sort of decided to look for a new way to preserve what makes this music indigenous. And that's when I started my first composition project where uh, rather than taking these chants and, and writing them down note for note, which wouldn't really be possible or probably even appropriate anyway, but to take some of these elements that uh, inspire the music and the foundation and to create something new as a new way of preservation to breathe a little bit of a different life into these uh, and perhaps reach a new audience and um, keep some of these elements that are so important and also to create new repertoire uh, and inspiration for, for future generations because I definitely encountered a lot of resistance as an indigenous musician and it was a very lonely feeling uh, growing up and learning all, all of this different music and very much being made to feel less than. And this music is often approached in that manner where it's seen as less than or not as complex or nuanced. And so uh, my goal was also to show that there is much more than just what you hear on the surface. You know, in the Indianist movement where there were other composers that were not indigenous but wanted to take some elements, uh, I think was such an oversimplification of what the music is and where it comes from. And I think it's so important that it's the actual people of this culture, the indigenous people that are the stewards of, of what this music is and what's to be shared and its purpose. And so that's sort of where I found my meaning, and I, I, my, my life took a very different path that I did not foresee uh, when I first started studying music and started playing piano and, and performing to where uh, I'm doing something totally unexpected. And I think that's because it's very needed. So 
Uh, I'm very grateful that I've been able to find that path. And there are so many other composers out there, and there really always have been other composers. It's just that we didn't hear them. And even in my time studying, when I was wanting to look for indigenous music to play, I mean, there, was, there were things out there. It, just, it was hard to find. And I'm hoping now that there's a, more of a presence and more awareness. And uh, discussions like this are, are exactly what we need, because the music speaks for itself. When people find it and when they hear it, they're going to want to play it. We don't have to do any forcing of that. You know, it really does speak for itself, and it is great, complex, uh, wonderful, enriching music. And so this is a wonderful way to sort of advocate for that. Thank you so much to all three of you. And I'll add to my own journey, which is uh, actually intersects with all of you, with Leah. As a child, my, my first piece by an African-American composer was actually Margaret Bonds' Troubled Water when I was about 11 years old. And I just had, happened to have a teacher who recognized that I should play and learn uh, the music of African-Americans as a child. And so she just slipped it in there. My father was a historian of Civil War and Reconstruction, so I was learning the history and already knew that. But to have a music teacher who is not from my same culture work intentionally saying, you need to know the music that goes along with your own history and heritage. With um, Ana Maria, I am that teacher that assigned Spanish <laughs> first for a lot of my students because not only because of the language and the five vowels as opposed to seven, but because the opportunities to teach another culture that is outside what they're going to learn in their music classes. So I've always, and I've always spent a lot of time in South America and in Spain, and researching and learning the, the music from different traditions. And Connor, like you, I've been a person who's been collecting and um, showing that this music has value. That has been very much a, a part of my journey since the man that just walked in, Willis Patterson, uh, introduced me as a doctoral student here at Michigan to the art songs of African Americans. And I remember reading accounts of African music uh, by the enslaved Africans being discounted as nonsense because those European travelers, as they heard it, didn't recognize what it was, didn't value it, and tossed it aside. And so that set a standard and a precedence of the dismissal of music that was different. And so I'm, I'm thrilled by the journey you all have and the connections your journeys have had and what you're doing for this preservation. My second question that extends on that, people such as yourselves who have engaged with the repertoire recognize the quality and variety of the music and appreciate the value in studying and performing it. In your opinion, and Connor, you partly answered this, why is the study of this music important, and what are the considerations that have prevented the study and inclusion of this repertoire in the past by teachers, students, and professionals? Why is there so much resistance? Leah's going to start us off. Yes, I love this question. When I, whenever I um, do panels or webinars, when the question of why is it important or, or why this or why that, and I, I say, well, why Bach? Why Beethoven? Why Mozart, right? Why are we talking about this music as in a comparison to another, right? And what I love to do is, maybe this is blasphemy given the conference, but what if we didn't talk about the color of someone's skin and we just looked at the music itself? What does what is the music telling us? Just like Connor said, like, it speaks for itself, right? Um, could I play one of, those, one of the videos? So, for example, I'm saying this in, in front of, you know, about just to sing a little bit. Everyone knows the G major gavotte by Handel. Da da da, da da dee, da da da, dee da da, right? We love this piece for young students because it gives us different articulations, right, in the right hand, wide leaps in the left hand. And going forward with that, we also understand the importance of Bach inventions, right, for, you know, early intermediate students. Same idea, great articulations, being able to do, handle that in both hands. Well, 
We need to keep teaching that material because we understand the value of it. But in the same way, we can add another composer who does the exact same thing or maybe does it in a completely unique way that could be even more entertaining or interesting for a student. So for example, could I play the Ella Scat? So just listen quickly to, to this very, very short piece. This is um, part of Portraits in Jazz by Valerie Capers. <laughs> students also really, really love the piece, right? It's fun, it's entertaining, um, it's a different language that they're able to use, right? But apart from all that, again, in a pedagogical approach, when we give a student a Bach invention, we want them to be able to handle a melody, we want them to be able to understand these different articulations, and what Bach tells us is that music is supposed to sing, right? I think as keyboardists, we have a really hard time internalizing that concept. But I think about what if we do this at the earliest levels like our Reverend Bach tells us to do, right? What a fantastic body of works, Portraits and Jazz by Valerie Capers, who tells us at the earliest ages, sing, make the students sing, put words behind everything that's happening here. And what does that allow us to do? it brings life and it just brings the, I should say it brings the music alive, right? So again, I always look at the music itself. What are we asking from our students? What are we asking for this young performer? And then the cherry on top is yes, this is by a black female composer, right? So I think that when we look at the music first, it helps to open up an opportunity for more people, hopefully, to feel compelled to want to learn this music, to want to be able to teach the music as well. Um, another thing that I often hear is sometimes teachers or young performers or even advanced performers, they feel, well, I don't know if I should be the one to, to perform this, or I, I don't know if I'm, if, if I'm allowed to perform it even. And to that, I, I always say, well, then what about me? <laughs> Am I allowed to play Bach? Am I allowed to play Beethoven, right? Um, and I think that, yeah, we talk about the music as this canon and you know this hierarchy, but we need to look at ourselves as well. What, what are we saying about ourselves as people? Who has the right to do something more than anyone else or any other group of people? So, when we look at the, the diversity aspect, I also like to look at, perhaps maybe even more importantly, is the inclusion aspect. What are, how and what are we doing to actually include this music? So what I often like to do is talk about pairing of pieces or pairing in a performance, right? I think it's absolutely, absolutely fine if you want to do an entire program by black composers. I'm doing that tomorrow. It's fine, right? As long as it's done well, that's what should be the forefront of it. But I also like to talk about what does it look like when if you give a young student a Bach convention, maybe F major, number eight, and then pair it with Valerie Capers, Portraits and Jazz. What does it look like if I have a student who's about to perform a Chopin prelude in G major, has these running 16th note passages in the left hand. And I noticed this particular student is really struggling, really struggling with that technical aspect. And I think to myself, okay, is there another piece I can think of that has the same approach? 
I'm sorry to make you walk again. Can I, <laughs> can I um, have you play the Betty Jackson King? Um, so in the same way, we can start utilizing this music and being specific about how we're utilizing the music. If I know my student has a challenge or needs more development in one area, this area being getting ready for a Chopin prelude that has challenging 16th note passages, I took a step back and said, hey, I know Betty Jackson King, again, another black female composer, wrote a piece perhaps a little bit lighter, you know, a few notches down in level, but it allows the student to develop those same exact pedagogical approaches. Yeah, just a little bit. Leading up to that point, I thought my student would be able to handle it, and I quickly realized she's not quite ready. But we still get the same type of techni technical um, approach by giving them this piece. Um, I have to tell you, Betty Jackson King, I came to know Betty Jackson King's music from the vocal end, because I loved accompanying her music. Um, and then when I found her piano music, my goodness, you, you cannot listen to her music and not walk away and hum those melodies. And that's what my students love. Um, that's what I love too, performing her works. So when I'm looking at you know, diversity and understanding how, what do we do and how do we handle this material, we have to be purposeful in the way we approach it, right? If we're going to look at Bach and Beethoven and look at their life, look at their history, we want to know everything about them, what they've performed, um, who their contemporaries are, what they were studying, how they were studying. We need to have that same exact approach when we talk about black composers or you know, any, any other type of composer. And I think when we start giving it the same type of scholarship in that way, I think we start breaking down these walls of the canon. Um, absolutely. I think um, what the Professor Toppin said about exposing students to different cultures, I think it's a big why, at least um, for me. I think for music of black composers, music of South American composers, music, music from Navajo composers, um, it forces the students to look not just at the music, but at the people that wrote the music. And of course, us as teachers, it's our job to encourage the students to look at that as well. So not only, oh, how cool the piece. OK, where does it come from? What is the rhythm that the piece is based on? Or is there a dance? Uh, what kind of people like did this music? And is it, is it a direct quotation of a folk melody, or is it just a more elaborate arrangement of it? Um, and I think inevitably makes the student curious uh, about this culture. It's like, oh, wow, I mean, look, this is quite rich. I think what you were saying before about uh, the conquistadors coming and, and you know, dismissing the culture of the indigenous people, I mean, that's a big part of what oppression is, right? You, you take a people and you just dismiss their music, you dismiss their culture, their religion, and you stamp that down until basically you strip everything that makes that culture what it is, right? And I think this is a way to, as you were saying, empower people of color, people from other countries, immigrants, you know, illegal immigrants. I mean, um, and, and your culture is as valid as this other culture. It just hasn't been, it's not as widespread and not everybody knows it as such. Um, in terms of uh, why I think also it teaches students performance practice. You know, it's like what you see on the page is not actually what you're gonna play. This is a suggestion, but you need to know this rhythm. Well, it's written in six eight, or in five eight. It's more like a five and a half eight. So it forces the student 
to, to deal with rhythm and rhythmic issues that are frankly not easy sometimes, especially in South American music, it's filled with this. And it's like a different way to teach a student how to have steady rhythm, strong rhythm, and how to count and then internalize that in order to make it what it is, you know, because people that play this music that don't read music know how to do this so well, you know, and then you say, why don't you go online and watch some flamenco videos so you have an idea of how this is actually done. And the students are blown away. And these people have no idea how to read music. Um, I think it's a great way to teach students about rubato, teach uh, how, how to, again, to step away from what the page says and then do something with it. And then that's something that you can apply to Chopin or Liszt, you know? So in terms of resistance, I think one part of it is like people say, well, I have to teach this, but then I have to leave out all these other things that I want to do in my syllabus, right? So what Leah was saying, I think, is like find a way to teach the same concept with different music. It doesn't mean that you have to not do this, you know? And there's still space for Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. I think students should be taught how to, how to, how to play classical music and Baroque music and romantic music. This is very important. So I don't think any of us here are advocating for forget about this completely and just like, just do this. That's really not the point. Um, a part, I think, of resistance is ignorance. People just don't know the music at all. They have never heard about it, any of these composers, which is, I think, what's important to have events like this. And people that advocate for this music and play this music, and as, as Connor was saying, show that this music has a lot to offer. You know, Sometimes it can be laziness, both on the part of the student or the teacher, because it's much easier to assign the stuff that you already know, right? Instead of like going out and figuring out what level of difficulties this piece should I give this to my student or the students? Like you say, go pick your recital repertoire. Well, it's much easier to pick the pieces that you already know, that you have heard somebody else play. Because frankly, it takes time to go and do research, right? Um, and then when we, when we come to the next question, we'll talk about some of these strategies. At least with South American music, a big hurdle is access to the music. So once people hear the music and say, wow, what a cool piece, I want to play that, where's the score? And it's like, nobody knows, it's not in print, it's, it's a manuscript, or it's lost, or half of it is not legible, it's full of mistakes, or it's simply not available. So you can't buy it anywhere. So then you have to ask a friend of a friend of a friend or the daughter of this person that lives in Uruguay. It's like, can you please send me a copy? And it's hard even for me, you know? It's like, I, I really am getting to know more people, so it's getting a little bit easier. Now we have the internet, thank God. But it's still very difficult. So I think more and more people, at least, in my area are starting to edit and catalog these works and produce new, better editions that you can actually purchase online. And I think that's a big part of, of our advocacy it needs to also be how to find this music and make it, make it available for whoever wants to play it. Uh, I think continuing, you know, adding on to that idea of accessibility and why this music isn't included or why there's resistance, uh, there is, there's this vicious cycle where it, it's not included to begin with, so nobody's performing it. And since nobody's performing it, we're not hearing it. And when, when we're not hearing it, we're not assigning it to students. And, and it kind of continues in that way. And I think that's a, a really big problem, the accessibility to the music itself, the scores, and just to being exposed to it can really be detrimental. And I think also a really, uh, a really big thing that contributes to this resistance is this musical disenfranchisement. I think it relates back to what Leah is saying about the youth. I know for myself, I experienced that when I, was, when I was younger and I was excited about playing piano and I wanted to, and I think I was about eight years old and I had a teacher that told me, you're never gonna be able to do a career in music because you're, first of all, you're American and so you're lazy. You won't be able to compete with the rest of the world. And not only that, you're an Indian, <laughs> you know. And that really affected me in a very terrible way. And, you know, it, it lit a fire in me. And I think I get that maybe from my mom to, to really prove that wrong. But for so many other young people, it just causes them to stop. And I just, it, it pains me to think of how much there is that we're missing because of that. Because people made students uh, or BIPOC feel that they are less than, and they're just not good enough, that they can't do it. 
that there's something unattainable about it. And then that student can look around and, and there's no representation, they don't hear the music, even if it might be out there. They, it, it, like I said before, it feels very lonely. And that stifles this creativity, it stifles future composers, future performers, future educators. And that is, I think, a really terrible part, which is why it's so important to start at a young age, to start with these pedagogical things and have representation from the beginning so, so that this possibility is, is fostered. Thank you so much for that, Connor. And I think adding to what you've all said, that on the university level, that piece of we don't have space to add to it is that thinking. We've got to change that thought that this means that we're taking something away. As you said, Ana Maria, that we're, that's not the goal. The goal is to be additive, not sur subtract. And as you said, Connor, to be the kinds of teachers that are able to envision for all of our students. And that it, it because that means that a student is not going to want to explore music of their own culture if they're, if they're already being um, uh, denigrated as a person, then why would they want to go look for the music of their own culture um, to bring that out? And then if they're not advocating for that music, who is? And as I teach my, my course in African American art song even, the singers are all saying, am I allowed to? Am I allowed to? They come to that particular class with am I allowed to as the first question. And I'm sure they don't come to their German art song class and say, am I allowed to be in this space talking about this music? And so what you said, Leah, the importance of taking it seriously. I even teach dialect as a language within my class so that they begin to see that it's not that I expect every singer that comes to my class is going to sing in dialect, but I also recognize that I'm training DMA students who are the future teachers, and I want them to be able to walk into a studio, and when someone comes in and wants to sing in dialect, they don't go, don't know, can't help you. But in, or, as so many students have said, send them off to go learn a spiritual on their own and come back later without working with them at all. They would never do that with a, a piece of Bach. They wouldn't say, go, go work on your own and come back and I'll just listen to it and I won't give you any comments. So we're still at that stage and I think you're right, the training from the beginning, but also helping university teachers who are struggling, those who are currently in the academy are struggling to figure out how to incorporate this, this repertoire. Um, so we, we do have strategies and there are a lot of, there's a lot of energy happening and that's what uh, we're going to talk about is what are those strategies that are going to then help the next generation. So Connor, if you'll start us off on this question, what are some of the strategies that you employ to encourage pianists to consider this repertoire and empower those who are concerned about issues including appropriation? Um, I'll start with the aspect of appropriation uh, because it's important because it definitely has been appropriated from many cultures, uh, not just in the music. Um, when it comes to indigenous music, I think a really important thing is if you want to support it, you support the composers that are there. The appropriation is when these things are being taken and used or trying to be elevated, you know, elevate this music because that's not what I do. I am not elevating this traditional music. I am just giving it a little bit of a different vehicle. And, uh, and it's very similar also to the other arts and crafts. You know, it's important to purchase indigenous jewelry from indigenous people. That's how they make a living. But there are items that are restricted, you know, like a headdress. You, you, that's inappropriate, you know, but, but the jewelry that you can support the people with, that is there. And that's another reason that having you know, indigenous or marginalized people be the steward of what they want to share and how it should be shared and what is appropriate, you know, as, as an, an audience member or a performer to go to those resources they're, because they're there or commission new works by indigenous composers or black composers. Uh, it, it's, that's the important part uh, in, a, in a really, in a way, simple way to address that issue of appropriation. Um, and I think for the other part of it, how to uh, you know, encourage pianists to consider the rep and empower, I think there's a really interesting thing that happened recently with Indigenous Peoples Day. 
uh, there was a lot of resistance from certain people to changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, and even within the Native community. I witnessed, where it, it was thought, it's just the name of a day. There are so many more important things to worry about than that. We have much more pressing issues. And there are more, you know, perhaps more pressing issues. Uh, but I think sometimes we don't realize how important that is, because with Indigenous Peoples Day, there was created a need. And I saw, just over the past you know, year on Indigenous Peoples Day, so many artists, musicians, writers, actors uplifted because these companies, social media, were looking for that. There was this need that had to be filled. So suddenly they are seeking out native composers to, and, and music to program on the radio or writers or, or different things that had been there for years. I mean, they had always been there and suddenly there's this you know, need that's being filled. So that's one thing that I think to really consider as far as empowering and, and uh, creating a space for this, creating a space for and a platform for the music. And um, for myself, I, I know that I use elements of the culture and sharing the culture and social media is a huge thing uh, to create an interest in the music. And I've done a lot of music videos that not only showcase the music, but the elements of the culture that people can find really engaging. Uh, I can share, actually I have one of my music videos, that uh, a piece that I wrote about traditional Navajo weaving and um, that kind of displays how this music comes from much more than just, uh, it's not on its own, it comes from the culture, it comes from the teachings, from the language, from the practices, uh, so if you wouldn't mind playing that.
I think what I, I really was drawn to. Thank you. The, the weaving really gives a visual representation of the complexity behind a lot of these cultural aspects. And you can see that there's, there's an incredible math that goes behind these designs and the counting and the formulas for each thread and how you know, she can construct this. And it took her over a year to complete that rug of working every single day. And there's such a correlation there with music as well. And as I said before, sometimes when we hear music that we're not familiar with from another culture, you can hear what's on the surface and, and it's oversimplified. So, you know, there's so many new ways to kind of share elements of the culture and, and, and seeing where it comes from and sort of everything that's beneath the surface is so important because it creates more interest and more respect. Uh, and, you know, that's what's going to get more performers and getting this programmed and, and into the canon is sort of realizing you know, the worth that's already there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and if you wouldn't mind, if, if you could show a couple of things. Um, most of the strategies that we're trying to do are performing a lot of this music as much as we can in as many places as we can so people can hear it. I think that's, that's usually the first step. People need to hear the music and like the music and get excited about the music. And that prompts them to at least start a search for this. And then trying to stay in touch with some of these people and say, let me know if you want access to these scores, if you want more information about the music. So that's, that's one. So if you could play maybe the, the video, just a bit of it. You're going to hear here some music from Brazil and from Argentina. Um, and then, of course, cataloging these works and recording these works. <laughs> So I think performance and recording is a big part of it, and then trying to, to spread those recordings around and, and, and sharing them with as many people as possible. And, sorry, one, one more thing. <laughs> sorry, I didn't think I said. Um, and then one thing I wanted to share with you today, in, in case you're interested, I'm putting together a list of, of a lot of resources that are already available, and some of them compiled by myself. So uh, for instance, the Sphinx Catalog for Latin American cello work is an incredible resource that tells you where to find this music by so many, it has thousands of composers. Uh, we're creating a catalog for Latin American piano trios as well. And there's websites like the Atlantic American Arts and Alliance or the Chamber Music Database. There's also a catalog of women composers from Spain that is incredibly thorough. Um, if you can keep scrolling, Louise, please. Uh, keep going. So it's like you have also specific pieces that uh, are appropriate for college level. 
uh, a list of composers uh, that are living composers with their websites, so you can contact them directly and ask them. They have a lot of their music on their websites, and they're all, all of them that I have contacted have been very open about sharing their music and telling you how to have access to their music. There's also a list of basically composers from every single one of these countries with examples of music. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of information and I'm happy I created this so I can share it with people. So my email is at the end of it. I'm also gonna be here for a while. So if you would like to have a copy of this, I'm more than happy to share this with you. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> Uh, but that's the idea, you know, that's one of my main strategies. And then, of course, uh, both uh, in my work at Louisiana State and in our summer festival, the Collaborative Piano Institute, I always make a point of having at least one lecture about South American art song to have a guest artist talk about uh, African-American music. Uh, last year we had somebody talking about Canadian art song, which is something that I haven't even thought about. So uh, trying to, to expose the singers and the pianists and instrumentalists that come to our summer festival and show them the wealth and the richness of this repertoire and have our faculty perform those in faculty concerts and even assign them some of this rep ahead of time for the, for the participants of our festival. Um, I, first I have to give in both of you, it's just so amazing, like the work that you're doing, it really, nice. really is. Um, um, yes, with this I, I was thinking that something my parents always used to tell me, which is you can't fault people for what they don't know, right? But at the same time, once they do know, you have to hold them accountable for it. And I think we're in this point right now where there actually is, I feel, a lot of access. There is a lot of research like you're doing, um, Anna Maria and Connor and myself included, and a multitude of, of people, right? There is so much information to, and you, with your, <laughs> you're sitting here, right? <laughs> the, front, the front runner of it all. Um, there's just so much, there's so much research available, right? You actually don't need to be a scholar. You don't need to have a DMA. Um, to go on the internet and just look up what's available because there are people like here who have done the research, um, done the scholarship. Um, so I, I think that we need to move past that a little bit in a way, if I'm being honest, um, and say, hey, there's no more excuses, right? It can't just be me, it can't just be you know everyone here. You, you need to make a choice to do something about it. The music's out there. The, for some, the access is there. <laughs> For some, the yeah, access is there. Some. Recordings are there. Um, so at some point, there needs to be, you know, a passing of the torch for people to utilize the music and perform it. Thank you all for the answers. You partially started to answer both the fourth and the fifth question. So I'm going to ask the questions and let uh, let us go ahead and finish the questions. The incorporation of diverse perspectives is unfortunately sometimes, oftentimes relegated to checking a box or diversity scorecards. In the future, how should we instead think about inclusion, decolonizing the keyboard standard musical canon, and most importantly, what does accountability look like? Accountability as a tie to organizational goals. And Anna Maria, if you'll start us off. Um, yeah, this is, it's a difficult question for sure. And uh, it took me a while to wrap my, hand, my head around it. Um, I think, of course, a lot of the things that we've been talking about are part of the solution. I think in terms of accountability for organizations, I think that honestly the change needs to start with the people that run the organization. So to have more people, more diverse people in the board, more diverse people in the leadership of their organization, more diverse people in the faculty of, of a university, and um, diverse people that want to advocate for these things. And also, once you hire those people, then you need to give them space, and you need to give them support to do what they want to do. Because I think what a lot happens in many places is that you hire somebody for the diversity card, but then you don't really listen to what they have to say or just sideline them. So if you're gonna do that, then you have to commit of offering the space for that person to, to develop what they have to offer and to share it and to listen to what they have to say. So I think slowly organizations are starting to hire 
a diversity manager or somebody who is dedicated to that. I, I did a little bit of research and a lot of museums here in the United States are starting to do that. The Met just did that last year. So, and, and hopefully it's not just, okay, we hired this person and that's, we've done our job because that's not enough. Um, and it's, it's difficult, you know, to follow up on these things and that are you actually doing what you're saying that you're doing? But I think if you don't have those people in the board, if you don't have those people in the leadership, then it's easy to just forget about these things. And then, you know, uh, that will change what you see on the walls of a museum. That will change the music that you see presented on a season in an opera house or in a chamber music season or an orchestra. So I, I, think, I think that's a big part of it. I think accountability is also recognizing your mistakes. Um, just to, to give you a, a, an example, uh, in the institution where I work with, there was an issue with one of the operas that was set up in a, in a way that, frankly, I thought it was very insensitive. And uh, nobody seemed to think it was a problem until something mentioned it. And um, my, the chair of the school music in a faculty meeting brought this up. And the people who did it, they talked about it and they apologized. And they said, I'm so sorry, like we didn't think this was gonna be a problem. And this is obviously insensitive because we're white males. So we didn't, we didn't think this is an issue. And then they had all the people that were tied to the problem or who, who honestly thought it was a problem. I did too, and I thought, wow, how, how could you not see this, you know? But hey, at least they publicly recognized it. So I think accountability is also it's like, I'm sorry, like we really didn't mean, I'm so sorry. And people make mistakes, it's true. And part is recognizing your own biases and seeing, and this is a way to recognize your own biases. So I, I respect that. I thought that was a great thing for my chair to do and for the people to step up and say it and then have a conversation about it. It's not just like, I'm sorry, but also let's have a discussion about it. Why is this a problem? Why is this not appropriate, you know? So um, I think sometimes it's money, you know, does the organization have money to hire somebody to be the diversity person? And if not, then find somebody who can support this hire, you know, go out there and, and specifically raise funds for this because the organization believes this is something important. Um, so, you know, of course, of course it's complicated, but nobody said it wasn't going to be, and it doesn't have to always be. I think once we start changing our mindsets, then hopefully things will get better. Um, I think another way is like when we talk about outreach, I think a lot of organizations do like the token outreach. Okay, let's just do one concert and let's bring these poor kids to see the concert and that's it, we've done our job. And I don't think that's something that's gonna produce a lasting impact. So I think it's more about the organization going out in the community what, and seeing what, the, what does the community need, you know? And um, to have people from that community and saying, well, this is what happened last time I went to a classical musical concert, somebody shushed me or whatever, you know? It's like, it wasn't a good experience, I never came back. Or, oh, this music is boring, I don't really wanna see it. So having that conversation with the community and listen to what they have to say and then creating something based on that. So, um, like, I think the violinist of my trio is somebody who has had many festivals in Venezuela and in Aruba, now he's bringing them here to the States. And he was talking about how, how they manage this, at least in Venezuela, you know, with communities that are poor or communities that are simply not interested in classical music because they have never heard it. And talking about how, for instance, in a, in a classical concert, to have at least one popular, quote unquote, piece that still has a lot of value, as Connors was saying, a lot of times this music is frowned upon, you know, even in, even in South America. Or the opposite, if he said in his festival he had a, um, that he'll invite a, a folk group that has a lot of following in Venezuela, but then they would open the concert with a very short classical piece. So all these people that came here to see this folk concert that are not aware of classical music, then they hear the piece and they talk about it. Let's play a movement of this Mozart divertimento. And people are like, wow, that is so beautiful. You know, it's like, say, we're gonna have a concert about this next week, why don't you guys come? And then he said he saw a lot of people coming to this other classical concert. You know, so it's like mixing these two worlds, it has been taboo for so long, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and I think it just makes both worlds richer, honestly. Um, so those are my two cents. No, thank you for that. That was wonderful. And as you, uh, as you articulated, the fact that, that you have to have people of diverse perspectives in the room yes whether that's teaching, whether that's administrators, uh, they need to be in the room to, uh, to help with those perspectives and not be siloed into uh, one person is responsible for all diversity for an area. And as we're wrapping up with our last question, I'll let the others respond as a part of this last question. 
Two years after our country has undergone a period of racial reckoning, what have you found in terms of efforts to include or not include this repertoire? And more importantly, how can we change from, how do we change from conversations about inclusion into tangible steps? So where do we go? What actions should be taken at this juncture? So anyone that wants to answer. I mean, it's, it's a big question, right? <laughs> Solve it now, right? <laughs> um, I, I recently um, wrote this article, and I think it's, it's talking a lot about this question, the, the accountability aspect, right? Um, and in, in this article, I was talking about basically this. Can we stop talking? <laughs> Can we stop talking? and can we put action behind what all this discussion is about? And what does that look like, right? So I was looking at some of the very top music schools in the country and looking at their audition requirements. And I was saying in this article asking, can we change that? Why does it have to be a Beethoven and Mozart and Schubert sonata only? If we're talking about sonatas, why not include Florence Price Sonata? Why does it only have to be a Chopin A2? Why can't we add Leslie Adams, right? So we need to start looking at these institutions, especially these high institutions, because I really do feel they create this canon, in a way, this benchmark of what is excellence in music, what is excellence in our institutions, what are we aiming to strive towards? So if we start at the top and at the bottom. I mean, everyone has to be doing the work, but these are practical changes that is going to make a huge impression, right? Same thing with competitions. Not just about changing the repertoire requirements, but having judges, adjudicators, who are going to be willing to take the time to learn the music so that they can actually evaluate it correctly. So many times I'll have students who have all these comments on their Chopin etude, all these comments on their Beethoven, and they say, thank you for exposing me this, to this piece by Florence Price, or thank you, thank you for this gem. You're welcome, but talk about it, <laughs> right? Talk about it in the same way that you were going to have the scholarship be behind these other composers, right? So yes, with the institutions, with their audition requirements, yes, with these competitions, and then yes, with the teachers, right? What we're doing every single day, well, I think we've all kind of been discussing with this trajectory of pedagogy. Great pedagogy requires diversity. So I think these are the steps that, these are the action steps, right? That we need to be taking to really start shifting. Because like we said, these discussions are great, but I think it's time we stop talking and we do something, and we all need to do it from you know, the top schools to you know, our everyday teachers. Um, Leah and Ana Maria really hit the nail on the head, I think, with a lot of this. And just to, to reiterate, I think, you know, I, what I found interesting and that I've seen in, in a lot of these um, issues that have been addressed in the past couple of years is a lot of institutions uh, reaching out to marginalized people to fix problems mm -hmm. that they created. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it, uh, you know, I find it really <laughs> at first laughable, but it's also a bit troubling because if you really want to fix the problem, it has to start with the organization. And you need to have these people in place, and you need to listen to them. And that's really the answer. It's not something that we're going to come in and have a discussion and, and, and plant a few seeds, and then it's, it's fixed. If it's really, truly something that uh, an organization or a community is wanting uh, to rectify, then put people in that place. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've experienced myself and I've in discussions with other uh, native musicians where scholars who are not indigenous are telling us about our culture and, and have the audacity to, to correct us or, or question our knowledge of the language and it's just so inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and that should be, the expert should be an indigenous person in these institutions or as these educators. And, and 
and as Ana Maria said, listening, really getting the feedback, because everybody, nobody can know everything about every culture, and we have to accept that ignorance. I accept it for myself, even a, a, as, a, as a Native American. There are 574 federally recognized tribes, and this idea of the pan-Indian identity, uh, just because I'm Navajo doesn't mean I'm gonna know anything about a, a Cherokee custom or the language of the Hopi. It's just so diverse, and I admit that ignorance in myself, and if we can continue to do that on a, on a bigger level in these other institutions and, and people in, place, uh, in places of power can really be comfortable to just admit your own ignorance and, and go out to these resources that are now available uh, to really make the change and put uh, marginalized people in, in positions of power and listen to them, give them that space. It's that, that's really the important thing. Just wanted to add something to all the things that you guys have already said. I think another big part of it is finding ways to include children from these populations in music early on. Because what happens is like, there's not that many African American pianists or uh, children of illegal immigrants or Latin American pianists or um, indigenous pianists because a lot of them just don't, either don't have access to it, don't have the money to pay for it even if they wanted to, even if they have seen a pianist on TV, you know, or a cellist or a violinist or whatever. So finding institutions that are willing to do that, I, I was just reading about the LA Phil is now starting a program to prepare students from underprivileged, doesn't matter what the race or the color, whatever, just underprivileged, to, to play auditions so they can maybe enter an orchestra or have a, a, some sort of, of career in music or just play music. So I think, and of course that costs money, and it costs, it's work, you have to go find donors who will be willing to pay for this, but there are, there are, and I think it's, um, Venezuela is a living proof of the power of music, and what you can do for children that have no resources, and how you can change their lives through music. So as I said, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what they look like, but um, it's hard, you know, and, and parents that have no time to take their children to lessons, are single moms, you know. Um, so I think that's, that's also a big part of it. If we want to see a change in it, then if we have more people that are not, or that are underrepresented playing this music, then immediately the families are involved and, and the, the brothers and the sisters, they listen to the concert and the family comes, so it, the community gets more involved. So I think that's also a big, a big part of it and a big part of the problem. Thank you all so much for your comments. I, I want to add one in terms of a resource. Um, I created a resource that's a free one called the African Diaspora Music Project.org. And in it, anyone, uh, right now it has about several thousand songs and several thousand orchestral pieces, but we are working on the keyboard repertoire, both organ and piano, and that will be opening in our next iteration, which is, I want to grant this year, and that's what we're working on right now, so that we can add that to and link to other people like Leah who have sites already um, so that it's a, we become more of a one-stop shop and begin to um, be a, that, that place of reference. And the way our site works currently, you don't have to know the names of composers. You just have to know, just go there and start clicking. Um, and if you go to see the voice ones, we have things like you just know I'm a soprano and you write the word soprano and just click the box and everything that's for soprano populates. You don't have to do anything else and you can begin to, to filter. Um, in our last few minutes, we have about 14 minutes, I wanted to open up the floor uh, to any questions from you all because um, I think our panelists have done a fabulous job of covering uh, this, this wonderful topic. But I uh, wanted to hear if there's anything you'd like to ask us. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you all for the wonderful insights you've given us today. It's cool with some of the ideas that I'm working into um, working with this repertoire and the curriculum that you teach young students. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about creative approaches to programming music from other cultures. You know, um, we've all been to concerts where there's one piece by, for instance, an African-American composer, and um, it's easy for people to say, oh, it's only five minutes long, it's a short speech on the program, but where is it in the program in relation to, to other pieces? Um, one of the pieces I'm thinking about a lot right now is uh, a four-movement suite by an African-American composer that was written about 40 years ago, and it was a period in, in writing, I think, for the organ 
where people were really interested in eclecticism. There's a 12 tone row, there are all of the bars and camp tunes, there's a lot of whole tone music, there's um, a movement that's really inspired by jazz. Regardless of what culture the piece came from, I think it would be a difficult to sell for most audiences. And so it's been challenging to think about like, how to program this, you know. Uh, in my most recent concert, I played the movement that everybody loves. But it's the movement that, that's very jazz influenced, and I think, as an African American, what does it mean for me to lift up the one movement that people might most closely associate with black people? So any ideas you have on, on programming, uh, I'd be really interested to hear. Can I ask first, what is the piece? Who's the composer? David oh, David Hurd. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you, uh, I'll ask you one question. How do you deal with any piece that's difficult in the same way? Well, do, you, do you go ahead and do the whole work or do you just do a movement? I mean, that, that's just a rhetorical question back. So, I mean, not rhetorical, I really do want to answer. <laughs> 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 I would stick to your guns. If, if that's your strategy for other pieces, I would do exactly the same thing. Uh, one of the things that I do as a singer is sometimes I'll do a program of African American music, all African American music, but I'll surprise them because they're expecting it to be spirituals. And instead, I'm using things that are in different languages. I, I will do some, some Afro-Brazilian. I'll do some French that I found from Afro-French. I'll do some Creole. I'll do all sorts of stuff so that I'm showing that there's more to African-American or African diaspora. I'll do African languages. Um, I do Igbo. I sing in Igbo re fairly regularly. And so you know, I try to show that there's a, there's a, a breadth to the world and I will either do them all in a program together, but if I don't want to, I will put a piece and say, this is my central focus, and I will program things that will support it. Um, but I, I have no problem challenging an audience to, uh -huh. to listen to an entire piece that, that has some, rather than even excerpting. I'm, I'm less likely to do just a, a movement of something. I, just, I want them to see how it fits in the context of what the composer intended, but I'll let my colleagues um, I think uh, the format of, of concerts and recitals could, could be so much more flexible. And I think that the music really, people love prejudged art. They really want to be told how to listen to something. And with all of social media today, it, it, I think it, it, there is so much more of an opportunity to create interest. And I've noticed on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok with even just a couple minutes of listening to somebody talk about a piece of music and the first thing that people want to do in the, in the comments is, well, now I have to hear it. Uh, once they start, they get excited about the foundation of it and where it's coming from, they don't feel so, uh, you know, separated from it. They have a real interest and then they're going to listen with intention. And I think that there's so much opportunity to do that with the technology that we have today and, and the reach to really create an interest and, and you know, not have a concert where we just come on stage and, and take a bow, play our, our music and go off, but really engage with the audience. You know, we can reach millions of people, you know, through live streaming and, and they're listening. And so I think that really, again, the music will speak for itself if you just sort of guide them. Yeah, it's one of the things I was going to say. Like, I don't know if you talk about the piece before you play it, but I, I find that makes a huge difference in how people receive the music. Because as, as Connor was saying, uh, if they know what to expect and you give them specific things to listen for, I find that's very effective. Even if they're not musicians, they'll hear it. It's like, oh, that's what she's talking about. Like, look at the bells or whatever it is that you mentioned. Um, something that might be helpful, like um, I'm programming this Stravinsky concert. It's like Stravinsky in America, so it's like really acid Stravinsky, right? So I didn't want an entire concert of that because it's really hard for the audience to hear. So one thing I'm playing with is like there's these three songs based on Shakespeare uh, texts. So what I'm doing is I'm alternating 
a song by Stravinsky, and that, sorry, a song by a different composer with the same text that is, you know, much more tonal, so much easier to listen to, and then the Stravinsky song, and then another song with the other text, and then the other song. So then you're alternating them, and it has the same text, so they're related. So maybe find things that are related to the music that you want to present. Uh, something else that we have experimented with is talking between movements, which I think is sometimes like, what sacrilege, you know, how, why you're breaking the flow of the music. People now have a very short attention span, unfortunately, thanks to phones and, you know, things are designed to do that. So um, that helps too, because then you can talk right before the movement you're about to play. And again, you give them things and just talk for a few, like a minute, and then play. So that breaks also the, the need to, for them to be listening, especially if the music is difficult to listen to. And they'll be, it'll be much easier for them to digest it. But talking, yes. Yeah, I just want to say I, I agree with everyone on what you've all said. And I'd also just point out, I mean, there's a reason you love it, right? And I think that shouldn't be taken for granted. If you love the piece, I'm certain that that's going to come across you know, for your audience. And I think your, your audience will love if they hear that you love it, right? So there just doesn't have to be so much focus on, you know, that's terrible to say. It shouldn't be focused on the audience, but it should be about the music, right? And agreeing with, I think generally we need to break down this, uh, you know, concert type thing. What does that mean and what does that have to look like? Um, I know recently I've been doing, you know, Betty Jackson Keene has these four seasonal sketches. And then I take a few of those seasons and pair it with Tchaikovsky's The Seasons, right? And choose a couple of those months that go along with Betty Jackson Keene's you know, season. So I mean, I just think there's so much variety, obviously, like in the music that we're studying. And when we can, you know, bring it with standard canon, that's also another way of honoring and appreciating, giving the audience even more variety of the music and celebrating it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Joe Gasho. I teach harpsichord, so I'm kind of in the canon. Uh, <laughs> I do 17th and 18th century stuff, so I just feel like it's not fair not to tell you where I'm coming from. <laughs> uh, but I want to relate just some ideas and see where it goes, but I relate especially to what Leah says about thinking about the music itself. I have the feeling from my perspective that honestly, canonization itself is cultural appropriation. That as I care about the music itself that I do, and I, there's a kind of tradition that says a certain group of people know how to do a music. And I find that really untrue, that when I delve into certain music, it deserves respect. And to me, that leads, even though my expertise is in European music, and I would say that relates to this whole historical keyboard thing, is people trying to appreciate and respect things where they are, whether it's on another instrument or whatever, I find that very valuable. So I wonder if, in fact, like, Forget the canon. Like, let's decanonize the canon. That would be almost more valuable to me from my perspective. That is it really worth being part of some club? I don't think so. I, I think it's better to relate uh, on itself. So I don't know if that triggers some thoughts, but that's so for someone who spends a lot of time in, in European music, and I feel like it's generally completely misunderstood by people who claim to be in that canon. Um, that's, that's, that's my thought, and I wonder where that might go. I, I just appreciate that so much. Um, I, I really, really do, and I, I wonder what education, how it could change if all teachers had that mindset. I also feel that for students, it would be so much more welcoming and um, freeing <laughs> to put the music under your hands, knowing that I have a space to appreciate this music or learn it or to take it in, right? Um, I also have to say, I've been hearing a lot about get rid of the canon, right? And I think we need to be a little careful when we t say these words because the canon was there for a reason, right? We might not agree with it, but I think we need to acknowledge it because when we acknowledge it, that's the only way we start to re actually break it down. We have to acknowledge that there are people in place who have been taking up the space. <laughs> we have to acknowledge that there's a reason there have been, you know, Western European, the white 
dead male has been the uh, quote unquote savior of it all and what we have honored for so long. So I, I don't wanna say we need to just dismiss it and you know go this other path. I think we need to talk about it and we need to keep talking about it um, and not try to erase something but to look at our history and deal with it so that we can make those type of changes. Yeah. Um, and perhaps looking again at the canon, especially from a pedagogue's perspective, as a way to teach the students certain things which are important for them as musicians and to teach them about style and how style is related to the language and style is related to the culture and style is related to the country where the music is. And so it doesn't matter if it's Italian or German or Colombian, you know? And it's all a matter, as you're saying, of respect from the music. So I think uh, teaching the students to respect the music above all, and I think, and to treat it from a place of hum humility and respect and excitement, it doesn't matter where the composer is from. But yeah, I, I agree, absolutely. Other, Connor, did you want to say anything? What's up? Um, I, I guess I would just say, you know, I think maybe Eliminating the canon might be a, a goal at some point, but you know, having that canon was the foothold of oppression for so long, and I think infiltrating that is the foothold, you know, for expression and creating space, and perhaps a good first step to to deconstructing these things that are put in place that have kind of held back so many, and uh, acknowledging it, uh, you know, as was said, uh, as just a means of, of a first step to reaching. Uh, hopefully a better structure, something better, you know? Normalizing something new, yeah. We have one minute, is there a final question or comment? Yes. Hello, I'm Dave, I'm the videographer. I was just noticing a comment that came down the, the line here, I'll share. Um, this is from uh, Ann Acker, she says, in line with Joe Gasho's world, I would love to have available works for harpsichord and harpsichord-based ensembles by modern, diverse composers, please. Wow. Mm -hmm. They exist. <laughs> I, think, I think that kind of relates back to what I said before is, you know, Commissioning new works is, is a wonderful thing, and I've seen so many different uh, ways of doing that in consortiums, so that you, to to make it available for people, you know, if you know, at all levels, you, uh, financial possibility, just contributing a little bit and having creating these organizations that commission new things and make it possible. Uh, if you if you look online, you'll find I think a wealth of of opportunity to uh, both find things that exist and create new things. Yeah. And I would agree with Connor. As people reach out to our database to ask us things like that, what exists in this combination? It's some amazing combinations that they're asking for. Even they're asking, can they take a Margaret Bond song and rearrange it for a string quartet and things like that? And so there's, there's some real energy happening and, and some wonderful commissioning. Is there anything else that came through? That I didn't see anything else. Okay. Did, did you see anything else on there? Well, thank you so much for, I would like to thank this panel for their time. And thank you for your attendance. Enjoy the rest of the day.